Good morning and welcome to Poline Road Baptist Church. We are so happy you've joined us this morning. We know there's a lot of choices you have online of listening to messages and so we thank you for choosing to worship with us this morning and our prayer is you'll be blessed as you've joined with us. If you are a guest, we would ask that you send us an email to let us know how we can pray for you and that you're listening and and uh, just a little bit about yourself because we like meeting the people who are worshiping with us. I do want to share with you just a few announcements of what's happening in the life of our church family. On Tuesday the 17th, we are having our senior adult um, world tour starting at 10 a.m. So you want to contact the church office uh, to receive the Zoom link for that. We're going to have a lot of fun as we tour several beautiful areas of the world together and have a time of fellowship and talking about some of God's beautiful creation with that. Then we're in the process of gathering money to buy gifts for the homeless here in Davis. We're going to do this through the Ministry of Grace in Action. It's a ministry that uses our facilities here at our church. So if you are able to help out, if you could either send to the church or if you come on a Sunday, put it in the offering uh, bucket and just be sure you write GIA on it, GIA. And that money will be used to get um, long uh, John underwear, hats, gloves for them. And I think we're also looking at this year getting a, a gift card for lunch for them. Uh, because of the COVID, a lot of things are in restriction of what we usually do and serving the lunch and inviting them into the, uh, the building here. So if you are able to give to help us uh, minister to the homeless here in Davis, we would appreciate that. So you can send a, a check to the church you're offering there or bring it by the church office. Uh, we would appreciate that help. And we'll be giving that out um, I think it's the Wednesday before Christmas. I'm not sure on that day, but you can look on our church website to get the specific information. Then also, if you're in the area and you want to come by and just stop to get a book, I want to encourage people. Uh, we've got some books here at the church. And if you go for walks and you pass one of those little libraries, the free libraries in, in your neighborhood, I want to ask you to take one of these books and just put in there uh, in the hopes that somebody would take that home and read and learn about the love of Jesus Christ. So we're looking at some ways we can continue sharing the love of Jesus during these difficult times. So that's one of the ideas I actually got from Matt Abbott, one of our missionaries that we support. So those are our announcements. This morning, I want to give sort of an attention, a, a wake up uh, to parents that may have children at home if you're watching. This morning's message, I'm going to be talking about uh, the relationship between a husband and a wife. And so it will be very specific in this message. Um, and so you just need to decide if it's appropriate for your children, uh, depending on their age and maturity. So you may want to stop this and come back and watch it later if you have little kids in your home. So I just want to be aware and make parents to know that so they're not surprised and they can make that decision because you know what's best for your children uh, and their appropriate maturity or age if they're ready for this discussion. But one of the reasons I want to preach on this is I think the, our biggest problem is, is we allow the world to teach our children, to, to give us the ideas of what uh, intercourse is to be about, what these relationships between a husband and wife or even between other people are supposed to be. I remember growing up that uh, I don't remember a specific lesson, but it was like S-E-X was a four-letter word, uh, and it wasn't to be talked about in the church, and it was just looked down upon, and I knew you weren't supposed to do whatever it was outside of marriage, but I couldn't tell you anything about it. And so that, that attitude of it was a distanced from the church, I think made it difficult for a lot of people. And if God is the one who gave us this experience to be enjoyed between a husband and wife, I'm thinking it's not our schools, it's not our TVs and movies, it is the church that needs to be teaching about this relationship and this joy and that we have failed our young people, we have failed society when we have shunned that responsibility 
God actually talks a lot about this relationship. It's probably in Proverbs the, the number one topic that's discussed. It is important to God. I think it needs to be important to the church and that we learn the boundaries, the guidelines, but understanding that those boundaries and guidelines, those principles are for us to enjoy this relationship that he has intended, that he's developed for a husband and a wife. So this morning, we're going to be looking at Proverbs chapter 5. We're looking at verses 15 through 23. I'm going to ask you if you would pray with me because, as I've already said, this is a, a difficult topic for the church, but I think a very important one. So would you join me as we lift up this need uh, to the Lord? Heavenly Father, I know that some people have probably already turned me off because they're thinking this is not an appropriate topic. Uh, and it is a difficult one for us to face, as, I think especially as Christians, because we still have this taboo that it's a, a topic only for dirty jokes and, and bad movies. But it is to be something that is glorified and honored because you created this relationship between husband and wife for enjoyment, for pleasure, and for that connecting of the two to become one. So help us this morning to understand the joy of sex, to understand your intention of this relationship. We ask all of this for your glory and your honor and for us to be on the right track of understanding the blessings you've given us in this life. Amen. So I want to start by reading Proverbs 5, starting in verse 15. And it's, it's symbolic uh, in this description, and you have to understand some of this would be cultural symbolism. I'm going to try to help us to understand that as we read through it and, and come back in and study it. But starting in verse 15, it says, Drink water from your own cistern, running water from your own well. Should your springs overflow in the streets, your streams of water in public squares, let them be yours alone, never to be shared with strangers. May your fountain be blessed and you rejoice in the wife of your youth, a loving doe, a graceful deer. May her breast satisfy you always. May you always be captivated by her love. Why be captivated, my son, by an adulteress? Why embrace the bosom of another man's wife? For a man's ways are in full view of the Lord, and he examines all his paths. The evil deeds of the wicked man ensnare him. The cords of his sin hold him fast. He will die for lack of discipline. Let us stray by his own great folly. Heavenly Father, I come to you again and ask that you give us understanding of what your idea is, what your plan is for this relationship between a husband and wife. Amen. So my first question for you is, what is the writer promoting here is the better way? What is it he is saying is that wisdom? Because if we read the entire Proverbs, we see he is encouraging his son to choose the way of wisdom. And he is saying here it is that, that sexual intimacy is only with your wife. He is promoting monogamy, meaning a sexual relationship between one man and his one wife. And that faithfulness in this relationship. You see, with this symbolism, when he says your own sister and your own well, he is indicating here a relationship of belonging. It's not so much a possession when he uses the your, but one of belonging. So this is a relationship that's not just to be happening kind of coincidentally with whoever you meet up or, as we say, hook up with for tonight. It is to be a long-standing relationship that you come to your own source of blessing, which would be your wife, not going out for anyone else. If we back all the way up to verses 3 and 4, we will see it says a harlot's honey uh, is the symbolism it's using here for that relationship. It says becomes bitter. It becomes bitter. We may find some enjoyment instantaneously in this relationship for this sexual experience, but it's only momentarily. 
and it will become bitter because it does not promote love. It does not promote our self-esteem. It does not promote uh, healthy relationships. I cannot tell you how many people I've counseled with who have experienced that casual sexual relationship and have come with heartache. It's never made anybody feel like they are loved and special. They may enjoy that physical experience for that moment, but it has always turned to bitterness. And the Bible warns us of that. It goes on to say, this would be in comparison to that of your wife who's always going to bring pleasure. If you come to your wife, there is that built relationship and that trust and that knowing and that connection for intimacy that God has designed. And there's where that pleasure is. In verse 16, he talks about that, those springs that come up. And this would be that man's ability uh, to reproduce. And he's saying it's not to be shared publicly. It's not to just be out there in the streets. And the, the concept here, the picture he's talking about, if, if I am filling up my cistern at home, then I'm saving that water for my future enjoyment. If I'm pouring into my wife blessings and love and, and relationship, I am storing up blessing and love to receive back. But if I'm just spatting it out on the street, that water dries up. It spreads out and there's nothing for me. There's no return for that. And so the Bible is being very clear in this picture of using water as the example that if I am saving up my love and my, my sexual relationships at home with my wife, I'm saving for my enjoyment. I am pouring into a person who's going to love me back. But if I'm out there just happen chance with whoever I'm meeting, if I'm sharing it in public, so to speak, with those that I hook up with, I'm wasting that love. I'm wasting that connection, that intimacy that God has designed for me to have. That's why he says, I need to keep that at home. As we continue, uh, we see in Hebrews chapter 13, 4, it says, marriage should be honored by all. And today we see people that are dishonoring marriage in jokes and movies. It's hardly ever that a marriage is seen as healthy and, and desired. And so many jokes about the problems of of marriage and uh, uh, you know the robbing of your freedom and just all these insults to something that God has designed to be glorious and honored. I think it's time, especially for us church, to come back in and to actually stop those jokes and that idea, but to lift up marriage to be honored as the beautiful thing that God designed it to be. And he goes on to say the marriage bed should be kept pure. That basically is pretty clear as well, that our relationship is to be only with our husband, only with our wife, not with anybody else's husband or wife with, or with anybody else, but it's to be kept pure, meaning it is not adulterated with any other relationship. And he goes on to say, for God will judge the adulterer and all sexually immoral people. We are going to be judged for those choices. Look at verse 17, and again it says, yours alone, never shared with strangers. Again, he's promoting that monogamy because he knows that's God's design. He knows that's where we are blessed. So we continue uh, and see that what does this mean to rejoice in the wife of your youth? Many of you know I've only been married for a year, so I'm in my second childhood, according to this verse. Um, but I'm rejoicing in my wife. That means not that I'm just doing what makes me happy. It's not that I'm looking for my joy. The word actually means to praise, to encourage, to appreciate, to honor, to value your spouse. Do you hear the difference? I think when we read that in English and it says rejoice in the wife of your youth, it means I'm to find my joy in her. Well, that's not wrong, but that's not what this verse is saying. It says that I am to praise her. I am to encourage her, appreciate her, honor her, value her. View my spouse in a positive light through the eyes of God. If I ask God to help me to see my wife through his eyes, do you think that I'm going to be frustrated with her? Do you think that I'm going to lose my love for her? Do you think that I'm going to scorn her? No. 
I will see the beautiful gift from God that he has given me. So this rejoice in the wife of your youth, it lets us know that it's our responsibility for our attitude. It is my choice of how I respond. And this is a command to me that I am to look at my wife and encourage her, to praise her, to appreciate her, to honor and value her. This makes a huge difference. Because the problem is the world sees sexual fulfillment as the ultimate goal in life. We see this in our movies. We see this in our books. We we see this in, in relationships today. That everybody thinks that that's what I need to have. And those that are trying to live single in the Christian life get discouraged and and they're frustrated because their focus is, I'm missing out. And you're not missing out. God has a plan for you. If you will be patient and wait on him, you will be blessed. The ultimate goal of satisfaction in life, my friends, is not a sexual relationship. It is a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's where I find the satisfaction. But we want to see that there is included in marriage that satisfaction in the sexual relationship. But it is not the ultimate goal in life. And it needs to be limited to marriage. We need to know that our marital joy lasts, but flings, they will leave a heartache. Because when we have that short time relationship, it may be fun for the moment, but it doesn't leave this idea of being loved and honored and valued. We know within our heart that feeling of being used, that it's only for that other person's satisfaction. So where do we find satisfaction and pleasure? I think it's pretty simple. God is telling us here in these verses, it's in our relationship with our spouse and not somewhere else or with someone else. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband, the Bible tells us. In verse 4, the wife's body does not belong to her alone but also to her husband. In the same way, the husband's body does not belong to himself alone but also to the wife. And we continue in verse 5, and it says, Do not uh, deprive each other except for mutual consent for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. But then come together again that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So 1 Corinthians 7 is telling us that we have a responsibility to satisfy, to enjoy our husband and our wife. We are to find that satisfaction in our spouse. We do that by just seeing how beautiful they are. Again, we come back to that, asking God to help us see them through our eyes. We see their beauty externally, but we see their beauty internally. And then it says in verse 19, we are captivated. The idea here is intoxicated, filled with their love. And again, that's an attitude. It's a choice. When you look at somebody through the eyes of God, when you choose to let him help you see their beauty on the inside and out, you are going to be captivated by them because you see this wonderful creation of God. And then it goes on to say, we are to enjoy that love, which is that sexual relationship. And it's that lasting joy of intimacy within a marriage that's found and founded on our commitment. If I'm just having that casual connection, there is no commitment. There is no security in that relationship. But in a marriage, it brings that security. of I know I'm loved. I know I'm desired. I know I'm connected to someone who desires me. And so I want you to understand, this is not just saying no to adultery, but it's saying yes to the pleasures within marriage as God designed. Media, TV, popular opinion, jokes, they just just degrade marriage, but God elevates it as the ultimate eros, as the ultimate pleasure for a husband and wife. And we do this best when we choose to honor and praise our spouse Look at Song of Songs, chapter 8, the first part of verse 6. It says, place me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm. What does that mean? The woman is saying, if you put me on your heart, it protects your heart to love me. 
It is like a door that prevents the temptations of others. It's like our wedding ring. It lets people know, I have somebody that loves me. I'm in a committed relationship. What's one of the first things a man does if he wants to cheat? He takes this off. And a smart woman will look for the, the suntan white spot around that finger. Because he doesn't want anybody to know, I've made a commitment. But there's a big problem in that. We need to view our spouse as what? as our lover, as our blessing, as our gift from God. Again, it's my attitude, my choice, if I'm going to enjoy God's design. This is his plan, but it's based on, am I going to fit into his plan? Am I going to accept his plan for me to be satisfied and enjoy that relationship in marriage? And when I look at my, my spouse as my lover, as my blessing from God, as my best friend, as my gift from God, this choice helps me to stay in love. Because you see, I, I hear people say, well, I fell out of love. I go, well, get back in because that's your choice. If I say, well, I just don't love my wife like I used to. I go, well, why did you stop? And they look shocked because they want me to understand, oh, it's because she's such a nag now or she's not as beautiful as she used to be or she doesn't satisfy me anymore. And that's the responsibility of that spouse because we make a commitment to love. We make a choice in how we're viewing that person. If we look at them as an object to satisfy my physical needs, then yeah, you're going to fall out of love because you didn't love in the first place. You're loving yourself and you're loving your own selfish desires. But a marriage is about me loving that other person, seeing the good in them and, and longing to honor God by blessing and encouraging and praising them. It is a choice I make. I think one of the things, if you'll back back up, uh, that I appreciate in my trips uh, to, to Asia is I see these couples that have what's called an arranged marriage. They don't get to choose, their parents choose. But I see, even among these Christian couples, this deep love and you're thinking, hmm, that doesn't fit with this American ideology of I've got to fall in love. I've got to find that perfect person that I have chemistry with. It's their choice. They choose. This is who I've been given as my wife, so I choose to love her, to, to desire her, to cherish her. And there's a picture that is going to pop up on your screen of this older couple that you still see this, this joy in, this little kiss on the cheek and the smile on the wife's face. And when I saw that, it was just like, I've got to include that because this is what that's about. It's my choice of how I'm going to view my spouse. And when I choose to honor my, my spouse the way God designed, I'm going to find that satisfaction, that joy in a sexual relationship, in a friendship, in that intimacy of who I'm connected with for life that I can't find in others. Okay? So what are the consequences of adultery if I've chosen to do, go different in opposite, opposition to God's plan? Well, we'll be taken captive, it says, and I'll be judged by God. I will die, the verse actually says, and I'll be led astray. I cannot tell you of a situation where there's been adultery where that person who chose to cheat on their spouse was blessed, where their life was better. And you need to understand, I tell this to couples when they're being tempted to cheat. A person who will cheat with you will cheat on you. So let me try that again so it's clear. A person who will cheat with you will cheat on you because that's, that's showing their character, their nature. They have no respect for God and, and his design and limitations. So when you enter into a relationship with somebody that doesn't respect God's plans, you can't expect them to all of a sudden change and respect his plans just because they've connected to you. You think you're so wonderful, you're going to convert them now to be godly when you're not either. And you chose somebody to enter into a relationship with that's not trusting and obeying God either. You see, adultery is having sex as an object of self-gratification versus marriage, which is choosing a bond with another person to be enjoyed and cherished. Marriage is about choosing that one person to enjoy life with. Uh, Lisa and I talk about being soul mates. We know that connection. And yes, not every day is wonderful and joyful. 
There would be days that if she was based on her commitment to me on how I made her feel, she had been long gone. But I trust and know that she made a commitment to me. And we work through those difficulties and it's sweeter because we are learning that faithfulness, that commitment of each other. That it's not based on self-gratification, but on God's plan for the two of us. So we continue to read in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 16 and 18. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said the two become one flesh. Do you understand what that verse is saying? I don't think we do. Because our society says just hooking up is fine. No problem as long as both of you want to do it. Don't even need to know their name. Don't need to know anything about them as long as you both agree. But do you understand you're giving that person a part of your very soul? This is what the Bible says. I'm not inventing this. You're giving that person a part of your soul. And you're taking a part of their soul. And it becomes a part of who you are that you never get rid of. And we'll never be whole again. We can be forgiven. God is in the business of forgiving us. He knows we make mistakes and mess up. He would never have any children if he demanded all of us for perfection. But he wants that perfection. He'll give us that ability if we'll listen to him and obey him. Because he wants us to be satisfied. He wants us to have joy. But we need to know we're giving away a very part of our soul. That's why the warning then in verse 18 says, Flee sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. There does seem to be a a difference in this sin. It is a sin against who we are. It's not just a disobedience of God and breaking a law. It is a sin against our very soul. That's the seriousness God has. And then look at verse 21. We may think, well, it's not going to hurt anybody. No problem. But in verse 21, it says, in full view of the Lord, he examines, which means he studies. God is watching our life and our actions, our choices. When I was a youth pastor, one of the popular questions the kids would ask me is, how far is too far when I'm dating? And I would simply say, well, when you go on that date, you need to remember that Jesus is sitting just on the other side of the girl and he's watching you. So anything you feel comfortable doing with him watching is probably fine. And they would come back to me after the date so mad at me because they didn't even feel comfortable giving her a kiss goodnight. But we need to remember that. When we are choosing to disobey God, when we are thinking about even tempted to commit adultery or tempted to look at porn, that God is watching We think in our society today because we can do it in the privacy of our home, on our computer or phone, that nobody knows, but nothing is hidden from God. And his heart aches because he knows we are destroying our very soul. We need to see also that this choice influences our very spiritual relationship with God. Look at 1 Peter, whoops, excuse me, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. It says, husbands in the same way be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner, as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life, so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Now, ladies, I know you probably got stuck back there as the weaker partner. Uh, We're not going to discuss that. What I want us to focus on is that if your husband is not treating you with that respect and that love and that commitment, it's going to hinder his prayers. How do I go to God after having abused his daughter, disrespected his daughter, and expect God to just say, hey, what you need? I'm here for you. It's going to hinder my prayers because I'm disrespecting not only his daughter, but God himself. Romans 6.16 says, don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you're slaves to the one who you obey, whether you are slaves to sin which leads to death or obedience, which leads to righteousness. It's our choice. But we need to understand this sin, this disobeying God, it will lead to death. Warren Wearsby says, it's impossible to sin without being bound. Look at verse 22. It talks about being ensnared. Cords that hold me fast, that I will die because of a a lack of discipline. 
We need to understand the consequences of this sinful choice. We continue. Um, and this one is, I uh, need to put those references up. This is Proverbs 6, 23 through 29 and verse 32. And it says, for these commands are a lamp. His teaching is a light. And the corrections of discipline are the way to life. Keeping you from the immoral woman, from the smooth tongue of a wayward wife. Do not lust in your heart after her beauty or let her captivate you with her eyes. For the prostitute reduces you to a loaf of bread and the adulteress preys upon your very life. Can a man scoop up fire in his lap without his clothes being burned? Can a man walk on hot coals without his feet becoming scorched? So he is who sleeps with another man's wife. No one who touches her will go unpunished. But a man who commits adultery lacks judgment. Whoever does so destroys himself. Again, are you hearing this? We destroy our very soul. We cannot play with this disobedience of a sexual relationship and not expect to be hurt, for our heart to be broken and affected. We see in James 1.15 it says, Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. We need to understand that when we start with just that, that thought, that lust developing within our mind and our heart. And if we don't stop it right then, it will lead us to the action of sin. And when we sin, it brings about that death, that spiritual death, that pain to our very soul. God is warning us, my friends. We continue in Proverbs 7, 25 to 27. Proverbs 7. It says, do not let your heart turn to her ways and stray into her paths. Many are the victims she has brought down. Her slain are a mighty throng. Her house is a highway to the grave, leading down to the chambers of death. Do you, are you listening to these words from God? These wisdom words? We continue. How do we find deliverance? If we've already found that we're stuck in this adultery and these bad choices, how can we find deliverance? My friends, God is a God of redemption. First one of warning, because he doesn't want us to suffer the consequences of sin. But if we've already succumbed to that sin, we've made those bad choices. First, through prayer. But prayer has to be coupled with an action of repentance. That I take those actions. And if it's porn, that they are many filters that will stop uh, things from popping up on your computer. And if you're serious about this repentance, you're going to do that. You're going to find a partner. And guys, I would not recommend your wife on this. It needs to be another man that is a strong Christian that will help hold you responsible. Who is going to ask you daily if needed where your eyes are, how you're doing. And you need to develop that strong relationship with Christ. Coming to him in humility and in um, brokenness. And as that relationship develops, he gives you the ability to see your wife through his eyes. To see your husband through his eyes. And then we pray. Matthew 6.13 is part of what we commonly call the Lord's Prayer. It's really his teaching us how to pray. And it says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Jesus knew this was a real need, so he included it in that model prayer. We need to exercise that model prayer and ask God daily to help us with the temptations. And if we've been struggling and have given up to these temptations, we need to have others praying with us. John 8.36 says, So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. The only way we're going to be free from this temptation, from the, the trapment and enslavement of sin, is to develop that relationship with him. He's the only one that can set us free. He's the only one that will deliver us. And as I grow in that relationship with him, I gain his strength. I gain his holiness. I gain his disdain for sin. And I will truly know freedom. 
We don't see always when that temptation starts what it does. Some of you may know the, the historic story of David's son, Amnon. He was obsessed with his sister Tamar. She was beautiful. And all he could think about was her. And he thought he loved her. And he, he just had to have her. And he was actually made himself sick thinking about her. And obsessing about her. Until he finally raped her. And then what does the Bible say in 2 Samuel 13, 15? It says that Amnon hated her with intense hatred. In fact, he hated her more than he had loved her. You see, when he got what he wanted, it wasn't what he wanted. He didn't love her. He was selfish and wanted that physical satisfaction, but it didn't meet his need. It didn't make him joyful. It didn't make him celebrate. Sin does not satisfy. Sin does not bring joy into our life. Here was a man who thought he knew the woman he desired, but he only desired her beauty. He only desired to use her, and he ended with just hatred. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, help us to come to that place where we have a respect for sexuality, where we have a respect for you and our desire then is to follow your plan for this enjoyment in marriage. For those marriages that are struggling and have been broken or, or have experienced adultery, we pray for healing and direction. We pray that you will bless and restore. For our young people, that you will guide them to make a commitment and a trust to obey you. Amen. So I want to end with this reminder, this clarification, not only to the women, but also to the men. This is in by no means saying that God would want you to stay in an abusive situation, not saying that he would take joy in you making a commitment to being humiliated and abused. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about, though, both of you having that attitude of love, of honoring God and how you treat each other. So if you're in a situation that's difficult, if you're struggling, please send me an email, give me a call, and let's continue this conversation. In our church family, we love supporting missions, and we've just welcomed on a new mission family this past week, and their names are Carl and Kathy Lahr. They serve with Converge. They actually live close to our church. And they're in the process right now of gaining support. They will be leading out in global missions, working alongside of missionaries, helping them to get the, the resources they need for ministry, counseling them, giving them guidance as they serve on the field wherever God has called them. So they're going to be in that leadership position. And they've asked us to pray for them as they're developing that and as they're developing plans to be an encouragement to missionaries during these COVID restriction times. Some of the missionaries had to come home to be safe and they're not able to go back to the country of service. Others moved to a different country so they could be in a safer situation, but they're stuck there. They can't come back home. They can't go back to their country. So they may not know the language, may not know the people there, but they're stuck. Others are stuck in their country of service so they can continue their ministry in, in limited ways, but they're fearful because they can't come back home. They can't connect with family. So it's a difficult situation no matter where they are. So would you join us in praying for them? Also, Kathy is trying to find a job here local to help in supporting the family, and she's had an interview. Uh, so pray for her that they would have wisdom to know if this is the job God has designed for her. So would you join me as we lift up Carl and Kathy. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity to meet Carl and Kathy and, and to be a part of supporting their ministry, actually as they support missionaries around the world through the Converge movement. Give them wisdom to know how to bless and encourage the missionaries as they face these difficult COVID times to be creative in how they reach out to minister to people, how to be safe for themselves and their families, how to connect with others for that support. 
And then I pray for Carl and Kathy, that you give them wisdom to know if this job that Kathy is interviewing for, if this is the right fit for her and where you want her serving. Give them that wisdom and clarity in that decision. And thank you for allowing us to be a part of what you're doing around the world as we give, we go, and we pray. Amen. My prayer is that you'll just have a wonderful week this week and that you will take a serious look at relationships through as God has designed so you can know that joy that he has planned for you. Have a wonderful week and I'll see you next week.